Hi, Nerds. In this video, we are going to talk about gastric secretion. If you guys haven't already, please go watch our video on the cephalic phase and the gastric phase. We have that intertwined together into one video. In this video, we are primarily going to focus on the events that are occurring in the intestinal phase of gastric secretion. So, if you remember, when we talked about these, we said that there's different phases, right? And then we have to regulate these different phases. But again, one more just quick recap on that. The gastric secretion phases, we broke into three types. One was cephalic. And if you remember, that was the one that accounted for about one third of the gastric juice secretion. And we said that it occurred before food even entered the stomach. So before food enters stomach. The next one is we talked about the gastric phase of gastric secretion. This was the one that was really, really significant because it accounted for two thirds of the gastric juice secretions. And we said that this was carried out by a lot of things like stretch. We also can call it distension. And the other one was by the concentration of, or we'll put in brackets, the concentration of uh, peptides. And particularly the partially digested proteins. So these were the things that were happening. We talked about the cephalic phase before food enters the stomach, gastric phase, which is when the food is in the stomach. This video, we are gonna talk about the intestinal phase. Now this one is extremely interesting because it doesn't really account for any significant amounts of gastric juices. But what we have to talk about first is what is one of the stimuli. There's actually a total of two stimuli, two stimuli for the intestinal phase. And what do I mean by stimuli? The whole purpose of stimuli, when we represent the stimuli, it's to promote acid secretion, okay? It's to increase this. If we represent it by inhibiting, that is going to decrease the acid secretions. So we wanna talk about stimulatory factors and then the main part of the video is going to be the inhibitory factors. All right, so one of them is going to be very, very interesting. This is called gastrin, but particularly intestinal gastrin. Now this might be for some of you guys who have watched our video on the cephalic and the gastric phase, you remember before that when we took the stomach, we had different parts like the cardia, the fundus, and from here to about here, we'll say like here for this case here, from here to about there is the corpus, and we'll say this portion is the antrum, and this end portion here with the pyloric sphincter is the pylorus. In the antrum, there was special cells that were secreting chemicals called gastrin. But that gastrin that was secreted in the stomach is a little bit different in chemical composition. What do I mean? This is a G cell, but specifically an a antral, antral meaning this is that part of the stomach, G cells. And this releases a special peptide the gastrin peptide, but that gastrin that it secretes, because it does secrete gastrin, it is 17. We call it G17. G17. The other one that's secreted by the intestines, particularly the duodenal mucosa, is intestinal gastrin, and this is called G34. That is the big difference. They're really, they're only differing in amino acid composition. That is only difference here. But they exert the same functions. The other one is being figured out. It's actually, there is some novel theories on it, but they call this chemical an entero oxyntin. They don't exactly know the name, but they found in research that this chemical, this enterooxantin, has been found to be able to stimulate hydrochloric acid secretion. We'll talk very briefly about that. We'll mainly focus on this one. So let's go ahead and talk about these two factors. So in order for us to understand what these chemicals do, we have to remember that this phase, this intestinal phase, 
is incurring in the intestines. So we have to kind of think about for a second the food going from here, the stomach, into the intestines. So how does that happen? We're going to have another video on GI motility, talking about all the different peristaltic and segmentation. For right now, I just want you to understand that when the stomach contracts, it starts here at the cardia, right? So it starts here at the cardia, and then the contractions move down through the cardia, down through the fundus, down through the antrum, and then down to the pylorus. This is a nice, very strong peristaltic wave. But here's the point that you want to remember. The strongest part of the peristaltic wave is right here in this pylorus. So let's say that this part here is the pylorus. And again, let's say that from here, this part right here is specifically the antrum. And then this part here, we're going to say that this is the corpus or the body. You can call it whichever one. And this, this part up here is the fundus. And this last part here is the cardia. So what happens is, is these peristaltic waves, they travel down the cardia, down the fundus, down through the corpus, down through the antrum, and down to the pylorus. It's really three generally strong contractions. So bang, bang, bang. The most powerful contraction, though, occurs here at the pylorus. When the pylorus, the muscles, the muscularis externa contracts, so it's going to try to contract right here. So imagine this is going to push forward. This is going to push forward like this. When it contracts, it spews out some of the digestive contents in here, except we don't call it uh, like food anymore. We don't even really call it a bolus. The bolus that actually dropped in here and got digested up by the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin, it turns more into a creamy paste. And we call that creamy paste, we call it chyme. Okay, so this brown stuff here, that's our creamy paste that we're going to refer to as chyme. So peristaltic contractions occur down the cardia, or like, the, like down the cardia, fundus, corpus, antrum, pylorus, and it's three powerful contractions. When the pylorus contracts, it does something really cool. It pushes backwards. So they call this, when they push the chyme backwards, it approximately squirts about 27 milliliters backwards into the corpus or fundus of the stomach. This is called retro pulsion, okay? Then, when it contracts, not only does it push some of the chyme upwards and backwards to continue to keep mixing with the hydrochloric acid, mixing with the pepsin, so that we can mechanically digest some of that food down and chemically digest it, but it also squirts out approximately three milliliters of chyme out into the duodenum. Isn't that so cool? Now, when this chyme, let's say here's our chyme, all these, this, we're going to put here this brown dots here. When this chyme gets to the duodenum, there's one specific thing that leads to this stimulation of intestinal gastrin. And that is what we refer to as partially digested proteins. You can also call partially digested proteins, we can call them peptones if you really would like to. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to write down here peptones, but peptones, just realize that peptones is literally just partially digested proteins. If there is a high concentration of peptones that are coming out here into the actual duodenum, they are going to stimulate these G cells. And these G cells, remember, they are not the same as these. These are your duodenal G cells. When they're stimulated, they secrete a chemical called gastrin. But remember, this is intestinal gastrin. So I'm going to put here intestinal gastrin, different from the antrogastrin. This intestinal gastrin is going to move through the blood, like a hormone, right? And when it moves through the blood, it's going to get up to this cell here. 
This cell here, which is, can be found in all different parts of the stomach, but we're going to say specifically here in the corpus, this is called a parietal cell. So this cell right here is called a parietal cell or oxyntic cell. <laughs> And remember, not only does this cell secrete hydrochloric acid, but it also secretes a chemical called intrinsic factor, which is important to be able to absorb vitamin B12. Okay? Now, the intestinal gastrin comes over here, and it has receptors that are located on this parietal cell. And when it acts on this parietal cell, it can actually stimulate the parietal cell through signaling mechanisms that will then activate that proton pump, that hydrogen potassium ATPase that we talked about in the cephalic and gastric phase. If that is stimulated, what's going to happen is it's going to continue to keep pushing out protons and bringing in potassium. At the same time, that intestinal gastrin also has receptors on another cell, this cell right here. This cell right here is called a chief cell. Remember what the stimulus was though. I want you guys to not forget that the stimulus was partially digested proteins, a lot of them. If that's the case then, this intestinal gastrin can also go over here to the chief cells. And it can act on the chief cells. It has a receptor on the chief cells and when it acts on this receptor present on the chief cells, it's going to stimulate the chief cells to do what? If you remember, chief cells contain these different granules inside of them, which have the enzyme pepsin within them. If this is stimulated by the intestinal gastrin, it'll signal this actual uh, vesicle to fuse with the cell membrane. If this vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, it opens up its contents into the actual lumen of the stomach. What is it going to release out here? It's going to release out here that protein digesting enzyme called pepsinogen. Let's actually erase this so we have more room here. This is called pepsinogen. Pepsinogen. Remember, what happens with the pepsinogen? If we are at a special pH, a pH of around 1.8 to 3.5, this proton concentration has the ability to stimulate the pepsinogen to be converted from pepsinogen into pepsin. What is pepsin? Pepsin is a protein digesting enzyme. So what pepsin is going to do is, is pepsin will come down here to where that chyme is. Like let's say that the chyme got pushed backwards it's going to react with that chyme. And if it reacts with that chyme, it's going to continue to aid in the digestion of the proteins within the chyme. So that's a, that's a really cool thing too. So that's one big thing. You can stimulate the hydrochloric acid secretion and pepsin secretion via the release of intestinal gastrin, which can be stimulated due to the increased concentration of peptones. That's one thing. Okay, so the next one is the enterooxidant. So they believe it can respond to the same type of stimulus. Uh, this uh, increased concentration of peptones. So if there's this increased concentration of peptones, not only can it stimulate this enteroendocrine G cells, uh, specifically within the duodenum, but this increased peptone concentration, and again, remember peptones is just a fancy word for uh, partially digested proteins. It can stimulate these different types of endocrine cells, and again, they don't exactly know what type of cell it is. They just know that it releases this unknown chemical which is called enterooxidin, and this enterooxidin actually circulates through the blood. So here I'm going to combine it with this gastrin. It's going to come up here, and they again they believe that it works on the parietal cell, and through that, if it can work on these parietal cells. It works through a stimulatory pathway. So imagine here I'm going to pull the enterooxidin out. Right? So here's going to be the enterooxidin. It's going to stimulate a special uh, receptor. That receptor is then going to go and stimulate the parietal cells. The parietal cells will make more hydrochloric acid. And again, the more hydrochloric acid you have, you have to remember this.
pepsin functions best. So let's here, this is pepsinogen. And we're going to convert him into pepsin. And again, remember that pepsin is the active form. Pepsinogen is the inactive form. They can go back and forth between this phase. If you want them to go down into pepsin, you want the pH to be around 1.8 to 3.5. If you want it to go back up to pepsinogen, you just want it to be greater than 3.5. So the more acidic the environment, the more of uh, the rate, the increased rate uh, that this pepsinogen will be converted into pepsin. So there's going to be more protein digestion. It's going to be very efficient. So that's the important thing. But if you get really, really, really acidic, then it actually can inhibit hydrochloric acid secretion and again, alter the pepsin production. But just remember that this is the general uh, concept right here. One thing I want to point out, just because I, I want to be picky here, is if you get too high, like 7.2, you get to a pH that's like uh, greater than 7.2, this results in here, I'm going to put a red arrow here, the irreversible, this is the irreversible inactivation of pepsin. If the pH is too high, like, great, like around 7.2 or greater, this pepsin will get converted back into pepsinogen and never be able to get converted back into pepsin again. And then we're going to talk about that implication when we talk about the mucosal barrier. All right, cool. So now we know two things. One is the intestinal gastrin and the enterooxidant have the ability to be able to stimulate hydrochloric acid secretion and intestinal gastrin can stimulate pepsinogen secretion. That's going to help in this acid secretion. But remember, it's such a small amount, not a very large amount at all. Next thing that I want to talk about is the big, big topic here that's going to be a lot tougher to talk about. There's going to be a lot of things. There's a lot of inhibitory factors here, and let's take it step by step. First one I want us to talk about, let's do this one in, uh, let's do it in black here. So the first one here is we are going to talk about secretin. So secretin is actually secreted by what's called S cells. And again, this is your duodenal mucosa here. The S cells respond to different contents within the chyme because the chyme can be rich in protons. It can be rich in glucose, which I'll put up with a G. It can be rich with proteins or, you know, partially digested proteins. We can put peptones to be particular here. Let's put peptones. Or it can be rich in fatty acids. So there can be a lot of different things here. What we know is the S cells respond to two main things. One is they respond to an increased concentration of protons. That's one thing. But they have a, a really strong stimulus with increased concentration of fats within the chyme. So if there's an increased concentration of protons and an increased concentration of the fatty acids, this will stimulate these S cells to secrete a chemical called secretin. Now, secretin has a couple different functions. One is if we follow it up here, follow this guy up through the blood vessel, he's going to come all the way up here to these uh, antral G cells. I took it too far. Bring it to this antral G cells. If we come to the antral G cells, the antral G cells are going to have receptors on them for secretin. Okay, so they're going to have receptors on them for secretin. What secretin will do is, is it will act on these receptors that are present on the G cells and they'll inhibit the G cells. If you inhibit the G cells, what happens? Gastrin, as we know, remember, uh, antral gastrin and intestinal gastrin have the same function. So if we follow this intestinal gastrin, this purple, where did it go? The parietal cell. If that's the case then, the gastrin that's released, it, uh, it normally would go and stimulate the parietal cell, but we inhibited the G cells from releasing gastrin. If we inhibit the G cells from releasing gastrin, what happens? We decrease this process here. This was the blue receptor for gastrin. And it, it was normally stimulatory, but we inhibited its release, so it won't bind here. If it won't bind here, it won't send this stimulatory pathway. And if it doesn't send that stimulatory pathway, it'll inhibit hydrochloric acid secretion. That's one way that we can inhibit the hydrochloric acid secretion.
Secreting such a beautiful thing though, because one of the things that he also can do is he can also go to two other organs. One is this bad boy here, the liver. The liver is so darn cool. It has receptors for secretin here. And whenever the uh, secretin binds onto, so here's our secretin molecule here, secretin, it will stimulate the liver cells, our hepatocytes, to convert any of the cholesterol we have into what's called bile. You know, there's bile salts, or we can say bile acids. We know that they're cholic acid and chinodeoxycholic acid and glycocholic acid. The whole purpose to remember is that bile acids were the main component of the bile that helps to emulsify fats. That should make sense. So it's gonna increase the concentration of bile acids, or overall bile synthesis. Because there's a lot of other things in bile besides bile acids, but these are the most significant. If we do that, we can have a lot of bile made, and that bile can be drained into the, you know, there's the uh, common, hepa uh, common hepatic duct, and the common hepatic duct will actually drain from different parts of the liver, like the left and right lobe over there. And then it can come down here and join with this part here called the cystic duct. So here we have this part here. And this is called the common hepatic duct. And we'll say that this part right here is the cystic duct. Because this right here, this big old frecker, this is called the gallbladder. That's this guy right here. The gallbladder has a duct that drains it called the cystic duct. When the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct fuse, they make this new structure here, and this is called the common bile duct. The bile can flow down through the common hepatic duct, down eventually when it fuses with the cystic duct, down the common bile duct, then the common bile duct fuses with this big, big tube right here. This tube right here is called the main pancreatic duct. So it's called the main pancreatic duct. Main pancreatic duct. And when they fuse together, they form what's called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. I'm not writing that out. Okay, I can't. so again, whenever this common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct fuse together, they form like a dilated region here called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. What is important is there's a muscle that's wrapping around that hepatopancreatic ampulla. And that right there is called the sphincter of OD, or the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Again, that is this structure right there. So what I want you to understand is one of the stimulus was fatty acids. He went, stimulated the liver, the liver makes bile, bile will then be moved down here and we can release it out here. And if the bile is released, guess what it's gonna go and do? It's going to react with the fatty acids and help in emulsifying it, that's so cool. All right, another thing that secretin does is it responded to the acidic chyme. Look what else he can do. Okay, so if we look at the pancreas here, there's the main pancreatic duct. And then you have these little, you know, these little different ducts right here coming off. These are like our cinar ducts. These purple cells here, they're epithelial cells. And they are really, really cool because what they can do is, is they can respond to secretin. They have receptors um, on their membranes that can respond to secretin. If secretin binds onto these ductal epithelial cells, it stimulates them to make a chemical called HCO3 negative, bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a basic substance. If you secrete a basic substance out here, what is that gonna do? It's gonna react with the protons, neutralize it. So it makes so much sense, right? Okay, beautiful, beautiful thing there for secretin. So now we know three things. Inhibit gastric secretion stimulate the liver to make bile, and it also can stimulate the ductal epithelial cells to make bicarbonate. One other function, not really significant here, but it also has the ability to stimulate the chief cells to make pepsinogen. Cool, we talked about the S cells. Now we gotta go to the next guy. Let's do this one.
and orange. This guy is really cool. He's probably one of my favorite. And he's secreted by what's called enteroendocrine eye cells. These eye cells, they are really, really specific to high concentrations of, again, fatty acids, so fatty chyme. They also respond to high concentration of protein digesting products, so partially digested proteins. Again, that would be called peptones. And they can even respond to a little bit of the, uh, the glucose containing chyme. So they can even respond to uh, chyme rich in glucose, hypo, hyperosmolar chyme. But the big ones here is the fatty acids and the peptones, but a little bit of the glucose. These guys can stimulate these enteroendocrine eye cells. The enteroendocrine eye cells release a chemical called CCK. Uh, this is choline cystokinin okay cholecystokinin cholecystokinin is a hormone he can get into the blood if he gets into the blood gas where he goes he goes to the parietal cells if he goes to the parietal cells he will have receptors present on the parietal cells and if he has receptors present on the parietal cells, what he's going to do is he's going to acti activate this receptor. And by activating this receptor, it'll lead to signaling pathways, mainly G inhibitory pathways, that will inhibit that proton pump. If you inhibit the proton pump, you inhibit the release of hydrochloric acid. Now, that's important because the whole situation here was there was just too much of this hydrochloric acid substance is being released here. And we want to try to inhibit that from coming out here. We want to slow that process down. And the reason why is our duodenum needs to prepare. It needs to get ready. So there's a lot of partially digested substances here. We want to slow that, that uh, acid secretion and we want to slow the emptying of the, the stomach contents so that we can start doing some other things to help in the digestion of these substances. What are those things that CCK does? One of the big ones that you got to remember is he accentuates the action of secretin. He enhances it. He potentiates it. So one of the big things here is there is receptors on the liver for cholecystokinin, CCK. When he binds onto this, what he does is, is he enhances the action of secretin. What did secretin do? It stimulated bile acid synthesis or biosynthesis. What was the bile important for? For the fatty acids. So same thing here, we can bring the bile down because look what else the bile is doing. It's helping right here in the fatty acid uh, emulsification which will help in the digestion and the absorption. Next thing he does is, because his main stimulus is fatty acids, he comes here to this gallbladder. This gallbladder, he's waiting for a stimulus. And that stimulus is going to be that cholecystokinin. When cholecystokinin binds onto this receptor, it'll stimulate the gallbladder to contract. You see these red cells here? This is muscle cells. So there's some muscle around the gallbladder here, and when it contracts, what it'll do is, it'll squeeze out any concentrated bile, because the gallbladder is really good at concentrating the bile. What do I mean by concentrating it? It gets rid of a lot of water, it gets rid of a lot of electrolytes, and just really main sugar that there's a lot of bile salts, a lot of bilirubin, a lot of phospholipids and lecithin in that uh, bile content. But if he contracts, he is going to eject the bile out of the gallbladder and through this bile system. Now, here's the thing. The bile really doesn't get released. Remember we said that the secretin, is, its responsibility is to stimulate bile synthesis? Well, that bile doesn't really get released unless the sphincter of Odie says, all right, go ahead, bile, go out into this area. So you know what? CCK is so kind, and he finds himself on that sphincter of Odie. He says, I have a receptor on the sphincter of Odie, guys. Let me take it from here. So CCK comes over and binds onto these little receptors on this hepatopancreatic sphincter or the sphincter of OD and stimulates this sphincter. When this sphincter is stimulated, he will relax. And if he relaxes, 
This hepatopancreatic amphila will allow for the bile, the bicarbonate, and all the different things that we'll talk about next to come flowing out into the duodenal mucosa. So beautiful. Okay, so now next thing is uh, cholecystokinin is also going to act on the pancreas, but specifically, see how I kind of balloon this out area right here? So this right here, this is called the acini. This is the pancreatic acini. This part right here where I have like this ballooned out area. That's the acini. The acini consist of these things called acinar cells. And the acinar cells are really, really concentrated with what's called granules. So if you imagine here, I kind of zoom in on these cells here. Imagine I do that for a second. Here's a, a, a cinar cell. And these cinar cells have lots of these uh, vesicles or granules that are rich in uh, different types of digestive enzymes. Some of those digestive enzymes are like pancreatic proteases, and we'll talk about these when we talk about the chemical digestion absorption of proteins, like trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase. There's other ones which is called pancreatic amylase. There's another one which is actually going to be pancreatic lipase. And then one more which is actually going to be pancreatic nucleases. So we have a whole bunch of these digestive enzymes. Now if you remember, the thing that was stimulating him was fatty acids, peptides, and glucose. Well, look at what we have here. Proteases break down the proteins. Pancreatic amylase breaks down the glucose or different types of uh, carbohydrate molecules here. Let's actually fix this and let's put, um, let's actually put what's called oligosaccharides. That's a better uh, word to put in here because these are different types of uh, digestive carbohydrates, the broke breakdown products, usually like three to um, eight maybe glucose units in length. So that's one thing. The peptones, again, they can be broken down by the proteases, the lipase can break down the fatty acids, and the amylase can help to break down some of these oligosaccharides or maybe even some polysaccharides. So that's one of the beautiful things here. So if we put a CCK receptor on this acinar cell, this is our acinar cell, the CCK can bind onto this acinar cell, stimulate the actual fusion of these vesicles with the cell membrane. If these are fused with the cell membrane, they're going to release out their substances by exocytosis. But remember, these different enzymes are actually precursors, which means that they're not active yet. They have to go through certain chemical reactions in the duodenum to become active, and that's a good thing. Think about it. If you start releasing these digestive enzymes out here, they can start reacting with your own epithelial cells of the pancreas, digesting the pancreas. That can happen in pancreatitis. We don't want that. We only want them to become active out here. So that's one big thing there. So we know CCK is also acting here on the acinar cells to stimulate the release of Pancreatic proteases, pancreatic nucleases, pancreatic amylases, and pancreatic lipases. So that's what we know. We know it stimulates uh, potentiates secretins action, causes gallbladder contractions, relaxes the sphincter of Odi, and stimulates the pancreatic acinar cells to release pancreatic digestive enzymes. And we said that it also was able to inhibit the parietal cells from making, making hydrochloric acid. And again, one more reason why I'm telling you that, because that can be confusing, is that you have to remember the stomach has a thick, thick mucosal barrier. And that proton concentration is really, really high in here. If you dump that chyme out with such a high proton concentration out here, you can damage the duodenal lining. And we do not want that. We don't want to have any duodenal ulcers. So that's why it's such a beautiful thing that it only squirts out just a little bit, three mils at a time, kind of letting the duodenum taste it, get ready, let it know what's actually going to be the content of this chyme and if they need to make any modifications to it. So it's a beautiful system. So if there is, uh, there's this other, these other cells, they're endocrine cells. And again, not, uh, we're not going to talk too much about these, but they can respond to distension, which can be coming from like a lot of chyme. Uh, so if there is a lot of chyme in the intestines, this can distend the walls and activate these different endocrine cells. So some of these endocrine cells here, let's actually do this one in red. Some of these endocrine cells that can be here, uh, they release two different chemicals. 
and they can release what's called peptide Y, Y, and they can secrete another chemical called neurotensin. And what these chemicals can do is, is they can also move through the blood. When they move through the blood, again, this would be peptide, Y, Y, and I'm going to put NT for neurotensin. These two chemicals here have the ability to act on receptors present on the parietal cell. If they act on these receptors present in the parietal cell, these signals that it's going to send to this proton ATPase is going to be inhibitory. And if it's inhibitory, there will be less hydrochloric acid production. And this less hydrochloric acid production is, again, going to prevent the excessive release of the actual acidic chyme into the duodenum. One last cell that we have to uh, hit here is going to be, I'm going to put him right here. This is actually going to be called the uh, K cells, the enteroendocrine K cells. Now the enteroendocrine K cells, they primarily respond to uh, high concentrations of, um, let's say here, oligosaccharides. Again, glucose, if we have a polymer of glucose, like three to eight in length, we can say that this is a oligosaccharide. I want to be specific here. If there's high concentrations of uh, hyperosmolar, high concentrations of these oligosaccharides or even polysaccharides, that can stimulate these K cells. Or if there is high concentrations of fats, that can also stimulate these K cells. If these K cells are stimulated by high concentrations of fatty acids or high concentrations of oligosaccharides, it'll trig trigger the K cells to release a chemical called GI. P, which stands for gastric inhibitory peptide, or sometimes they even call it glucose-dependent uh, insulinotropic peptide. <laughs> I love people probably like gastric inhibitory peptide. But you can hear by the word gastric inhibitory peptide. What do you think he's going to do? He'll travel through the blood, and he also has receptors present here on the parietal cell. And if he has receptors present here on the parietal cell, GIP, he also can act on this receptor and trigger intracellular inhibitory signals to inhibit the uh, parietal cells from releasing any more hydrochloric acid. But there's one thing that's even more significant for GIP besides inhibiting uh, gastric secretion. He also can inhibit some of the GI emptying, like emptying the chyme in. He also has receptors present on these blue blobs here. These blue blobs here are called your islets of Langerhan. And the islets of Langerhan have beta cells and alpha cells, <clears throat> delta cells, PP cells, F cells, there's a whole bunch. But the big one is going to be pancreatic beta cells. And the pancreatic beta cells are very, very sensitive. They have receptors on them for glucose, insulinotropic peptide, or gastric inhibitory peptide. And what it does is it stimulates the release of insulin. And again, this should make sense. If you watch a lot of our biochemistry videos, insulin is primarily responsible for being able to decrease blood glucose levels. And it's primarily released whenever we are feeding, during the fed state. If it's released during the fed state, it's then going to be able to increase the glucose uptake, increase amino acid uptake, increase glycogenesis, increase lipogenesis, increase protein synthesis. So it's going to take all these nutrients that we're going to get ready to absorb and get ready to push it into our cell and, and actually store it, do anabolic processes. So that is a really cool thing there. Okay, and the final thing that I'm going to talk about here, I'm not going to spend too much time is, is that Again, the central nervous system, we have the cranial nerve 10. Cranial nerve 10. Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, which you probably can't see here, but it might even look like a V. Cranial nerve 10. The vagus nerve also does have receptors present on these pancreatic beta cells. So they can also come over here and act on muscarinic receptors because you know the uh, vagus nerve releases a chemical called acetylcholine, and acetylcholine can stimulate these pancreatic beta cells to release insulin. In the same way, there's also receptors for 
acetylcholine present on the sphincter of Oedi to relax that. And they believe that there's also receptors here present on the gallbladder to help in gallbladder contractions. The last thing here and we're going to be done is if there is this chyme and it is really, really, really acidic, there's chemoreceptors that will pick that up. If there's chemoreceptors that will pick up that extremely high concentration of protons, what it'll do is, this is a really strong stimulus, it'll activate these chemoreceptors and these chemoreceptors will send information and what this will do is it'll inhibit the vagus nerve. If the vagus nerve is inhibited, I want you guys to remember what the vagus nerve did. The vagus nerve actually has fibers that come down here to the parietal cells in the stomach. You remember there was the parietal cells over there. The parietal cells are very, very sensitive to the acetylcholine. It's probably one of their strongest stimulus is the acetylcholine. And if acetylcholine acts on these parietal cells, it's going to continue to stimulate hydrochloric acid secretion. But if you have high concentrations of proton, you don't want to destroy the duodenal lining. So the chemoreceptors will pick it up, inhibit the vagus nerve, and it'll decrease the hydrochloric acid secretion. At the same time that it inhibits the parasympathetic outflow, it stimulates the sympathetic outflow. So look, here, here we're going to have a uh, paravertebral ganglion for the sympathetic nervous system. Right, so this right here is called a paravertebral ganglion. And if it was going to the stomach, like this would be like the celiac ganglion. But what happens is, is these fibers, they can actually stimulate this paravertebral ganglion, increase the action potentials coming down this postganglionic nerve. If that happens then, what it'll do is, it'll act on this muscle right here, which is called the pyloric sphincter. So it has receptors here, uh, primarily of alpha-1, adrenergic receptors in nature. What it'll do, that sucker is going to squeeze like it's never squeezed before, and if it squeezes, it's going to prevent the chyme from being released out here into the duodenum to, again, prevent the damage, that, the corrosive damage from this high proton concentration. To finish this off, I want to take this last uh, like minute to, to say one more thing. Our stomach is so good, because we were talking about all this corrosive acid damage, all this hydrochloric acid secretion, pepsin secretion. People will sometimes wonder, how does the stomach not digest itself? Because you know, the hydrochloric acid secretion, the proton concentration inside of the stomach is 100,000 times more concentrated than our own blood. That is unbelievable. So if we have that much proton concentration and pepsin secretion, how does it not just digest the whole stomach itself? Well, there is this barrier. Imagine here in this pink. This pink, I want you to imagine, is kind of coating all around in the entire stomach. Like here, I'll put it like a little bit of right here. This pink stuff right here is what's called a mucosal barrier, and it's made up of two things. So what is the mucosal barrier made up of? It's made up of two different uh, things. One is it has what's called a mucus gel layer. So two things here for the mucosal barrier. One for the mucosal barrier is it has what's called a gel layer, a mucus gel layer, and that's on top. So this is on top, okay? Below the gel layer is a high concentration of bicarbonate. And again, remember bicarbonate is a basic substance. These two things here, the gel layer, if you really want to remember, it's made up of a lot of water. It's made up of a lot of phospholipids. And another thing that it's really high in concentration of is it's really, really high in concentration of what's called mucins. And these glycoproteins are really, really viscous. They're really, really thick. And they help to be able to, again, increase this viscosity, this thick, thick layer. And what it does is, is it prevents the proton concentration prevents the protons from being able to get through here. Next thing is, think about this, this is what's so darn cool. Pepsin, remember we said that it's, it's inhibited at anything greater than 3.5. Well, remember what I told you is at the bottom here, right above these like cells here, these mucosal cells, there is a layer of bicarbonate right here at the bottom. 
So right next to these mucosal cells, there is a high pH. If by some chance the pepsinogen, or I'm sorry, pepsin secretion starts rising, and it tries to be able to move through the gel layer and down here to where the bicarbonate concentration is, it's gonna run into something. It's gonna run into a lot of bicarbonate. And if there is a lot of bicarbonate here, guess what that bicarbonate is going to do? It's going to inhibit the pepsin and turn it into pepsinogen. Same thing is if one of these protons try to penetrate through. <laughs> if the protons by some chance penetrate through, guess what we have? Bicarbonate. If they combine with the bicarbonate, what do you think they're gonna form? H2CO3. That H2CO3 is gonna break down into CO2 and water. And this is sometimes that CO2 can actually be some of the, the gas that we burp up there too. All right, so that's one of the cool things that I think is just so interesting about this mucosal berry and about the stomach itself. So much acid, yet it doesn't just digest itself. Such an amazing thing. All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we discussed a ton of stuff about the intestinal phase of gastric secretion. I thank you guys so much for watching these videos, and I know that sometimes they can be longer. I am sorry for that, but I really hope that you guys gain something from this, and it makes sense, and it's understandable. And if you guys did, and you guys did like this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, please subscribe. Also, if you guys get a chance, please go check out our Facebook, our Instagram, and even our Patreon account. All right, Ninja Nerds, as always, until next time.